Hello and welcome to Overnight Experts. This is a podcast where we are not necessarily the experts in the subjects we will be discussing. Uh, instead, we uh, research most of what we know uh, the night before. Uh, basically, how the show works is that uh, we've got three hosts and we each take turns um, discussing a topic that we're interested in or passionate about, uh, and the other two provide questions and discussion. Uh, so let's get into introductions. Uh, my name is David. I am a speech language pathologist living in British Columbia. Uh, I have a Bachelor of Arts in Anthropology with a minor in French, uh, as well as a Master's of Speech Pathology Studies. My name is Aiden. I am a case manager living in Seattle, Washington. I have a Bachelor's in Criminal Justice, and I do care coordination services for a youth counseling organization. My name is JJ. I work in network engineering and software development in Central Virginia, and I have a Bachelor's in Information Systems. Okay, so today we're going to talk about bats. Bats. Um, bats. I love bats. Bats are not bugs. <sighs> bats, bats are not bugs. No, but they eat bugs. Is that a reference That's to something? That's all I know about bats. Yeah, yeah. Have you not read Calvin and Hobbes? Come on. Oh, yeah. Uh, everyone I know loves Calvin and Hobbes, but like all the uh, the local newspapers that I had growing up were, I don't know what the licensing was, but it just seemed like they just it couldn't afford that, so they had a bunch of other things. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so my question for you, if bats are not bugs, then what are they? Well, they are with the E, so therefore they are bugs, right? Ooh. <laughs> wow, jeez. Okay, well, that was a good podcast, everyone. Yeah, all right. Problem yeah. solved. Good talking to <laughs> you. Okay, bats. I mean, bats are mammals. mammals with wings. Okay. Mammalian. Mm -hmm. Weirdos. What if you had to describe a bat to someone who'd never seen a bat before? I don't know, like they're... they're they lived their whole life in Antarctica, uh, never saw a bat, uh, and you're like, oh, well, this is, this is what a bat is. What would you, what words, I mean, what animals would you compare it to? Like, I would say it is a rodent of the sky. I would say it's a rodent with, like, leathery wings that flies around at night, and I would probably do this as an interpretive tap dance because we're talking penguins here in Antarctica. <laughs> uh, no, but I mean, I guess they also have like they have snouts, right? Like they got kind of pig noses. Yeah, some of them pig noses, mm -hmm. or like the uh, I don't know the actual name for the flying foxes, but they got like they look more like mouse kind of. Pieces. No, that's that's Is that what they're that's actually what they're called? called flying foxes. Like yeah, proper name, but it's probably just something. Romanized. Well, the, they've all got Latin Latin names, you know. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's that's what they're called. That's what locals call them. Flying. There foxes. will be no Roman names of any taxonomy in this podcast. <laughs> Oh, there will be so much. Oh, good. Thank goodness. <laughs> oh, yeah, we're going we're gonna to double down on this. We're going to go the other way. Um, okay, so uh, I noticed you guys said rodents a lot. Um, they are not rodents. Did you know this? I, I, I knew they were not rodents, yes, but they look like rodents. So how I feel is the important thing. <laughs> that is the way I look at it, too. It's like, oh, yeah, they're like rodents. But like so many things people call rodents are not. Like people look at a rabbit and it's like, yeah, it's like a mouse, right? No. Not even close. Rabbit's a lot closer to uh, a mouse than a bat than a bat is. That's so, uh, for for reference, a bat is more closely related to a giraffe than it is to a rat. Freaking what? <laughs> yep. <laughs> I love this kind of thing, but <laughs> so, I mean, like, what? That's all like relative, right? Like, how how close is a bat actually to a giraffe? Ah, uh, well, that's that's part of my discussion for today. All right, then. Uh, I did note down what other languages call bats, because uh, I thought that was interesting as well, because they all make the same or similar mistakes. Really? So in Spanish, do you guys speak any Spanish? No. That's okay, Spanish for no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Not enough. <laughs> so the Spanish word for a bat is murcielago. Oh, I like that. Uh, uh, which right. comes from the, uh, uh, well, I guess it's Latin or like older Spanish, uh, basically the rat of the sky. <laughs> like that. Um, which, which it is not a rat, uh, but it does, it does spend time in the sky. Uh, in French, this is really weird. I had to dive a little deep. So Aiden, you speak a little French. Do you know the word for bat? I do not know. So the word for bat is chauve-souris. Okay. Which is literally a bald mouse. Yeah. Bald? But... Yeah, <laughs> well, that's the thing, uh, which you can see, like it's leathery wings, like they're not, like they're true. bald, question mark, but actually they think it's a corruption of the Latin cavasorex, which is an owl mouse. Huh. 
Now, okay, that hmm. that starts to tie in a little closer to other interpretations. I get that. Mm -hmm. But none of like it's very. Like, I think I imagine most languages, whatever their word for bat is, incorporates rat or mouse or some version of that. I should have looked up what English, where the English for bat comes from. <laughs> yeah, you just think bats, and it's like, well, what's the, actually? You know what? I have. I think I have etymology up here somewhere. Oh, it comes from the old Swedish nat baka, which means night bat. Okay, so Wait. bat means bat. That's real helpful. Okay. <gasps> All right. That doesn't help. Oh, they think it like it comes from the word from the the word black or ba blag uh, from the word to strike or flap. So it was a flapper, black, a night flapper, uh, night flapper, night flapper or flyer, or maybe. Yeah, I can see that. Which I mean, I guess you know, like they have similar origins, right? Like, everything is just kind of a descriptor of what it is. It's not a, a mm -hmm. proper name. Well, there are no proper names. Everything is derivative of something. That's a, yeah, that's a, that's a different discussion. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. Um. So yeah, back to uh, back to bats and how they're related to giraffes. Um. So do you guys know the taxonomic divisions? Like the kingdom, phylum, class, order, family. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna say not specifically of bats. I do not know where they fall into that now. I got that order right because I have uh, the Wikipedia page up, of course, of course. Ah, uh, nice. I was gonna say, like, <laughs> do you know any of the <laughs> mnemonics? Because there's some interesting ones. Mnemonics in oh, like of well, what the different names they choose for each one of those. Like no, no, like how to remember, like how to remember kingdom, phylum, etc. Oh man, that's forever ago. I, I. Uh... <laughs> I, yeah, I definitely that. learned some during biology, but I do not remember what they are. So I found some good ones. Um, Dear King Philip came over for good soup. Oh, okay. I remember this. For good soup. Dumb kids prefer cheese over fried green spinach. <laughs> that, that sounds familiar to something I learned. Yeah, it was definitely involved dumb kids because, you know, we thought that was funny. Uh, and then if you look up uh, a vulgar mnemonic, you can get pretty much anything only the uh, GS for genus and species uh, is always good sex. There you go. <laughs> so fill in your own mnemonics there. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I thought we were keeping this PG. Uh, so yeah, we've got uh, domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, variety, depending on which system you're, you're going with. Some things like to divvy up further than species, yeah. Yeah, well, even in all of these, it's all it's very arbitrary because you can have infra classes and super orders, mm -hmm. and yeah, we'll, we'll we'll get into this. So, uh, at the level of class, uh, bats are mammals. Yep. Humans are mammals. Anything that is warm blooded with fur um, is a mammal. So that includes monotremes, that includes uh, marsupials, and then there's placental mammals, uh, like anything that is not a monotreme or a uh, yeah. marsupial. And it carries its uh, young inside the womb until it's ready to live on its own. Right. So that's uh, that division of uh, mammal is called an infraclass. Okay. So class divides into infraclass. So in the placentalia infraclass, we're going to get a lot of Latin in this one. All the word placentalia. Uh, okay. So that's that's like the main division of cross out the other mammals. We're still in the same group of, as bats. Uh, when we get to the super order levels, this is where uh, bats and uh, rodents and humans and all those things split ways. So these are the super order levels. And this is like a really fun thing. I don't know. Maybe it's not fun. <laughs> I find it really interesting. Uh, there are basically four major groups of placental mammals. Um, there's the Xenarthra. Afrotheria, Laurasiatheria, and Ewar Contagliers. Ewar Contagliers. Yeah. That's uh, <laughs> the, the outlier in the different names. <laughs> why, why is that last one so much different than the first three? Uh, that's a good question, because that's the one that we are in. So Ewar Contaglier means... You're a Contaglier. Wait, let's not throw around words like that. <laughs> don't, 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 don't get his class wrong, come on. <laughs> Or contact layers, clade and suborder of mammals. There's not an etymology of this. This is frustrating. Ah, uh, that would probably just take forever to de dissect everything. Yeah, but anyway, that's uh, that's a group that we are in. The UR contact layers, uh, which includes um, 
such wonderful creatures as primates, uh, rabbits, rodents, colugos. We'll talk about them later. Tree shrews. Um, mm-hmm. But that's about it. Like it doesn't. It's very separate to everything else. So that's actually one of the reasons why you can use uh, lab rats and lab mice for experiments that you can then apply sometimes to humans because we're most closely related to them. Uh, like primates, rodents, they are our closest living relatives. Right. Yeah, I've heard like the monkey or like some people will say like, you know, rats are clo- more closely related to the humans than say dogs or other things. And I'm like, ah, okay. But like, I'm actually, you can just kind of see like that by following up to you, the mm-hmm. contact layers and then just branching off there between two different set- sections. So yeah, that, that's the group we're in, the UR contact layers. Then Laurasia theria, pretty much if you think of a mammal, if I say think of a mammal, it's in Laurasia theria with the exceptions of the next two groups I'm going to list. Uh, Afrotheria, uh, these are creatures that evolved in Africa originally, surprisingly. Mm. Uh, Includes elephants, manatees, uh, and aardvarks. Good old aardvarks. What about the giraffes, though? Uh, Giraffes are in Laurasia theria. So they didn't evolve in Africa initially, like the, I mean, mammals are constantly migrating, constantly moving around. Sure, yeah. Uh, but the last common ancestor to the Afrotheria mammals evolved in Africa. Gotcha. Hmm. Uh, then you have Xenarthra, which are like the weird ones. So you've got anteaters, armadillos, and sloths. And Xenarthra means strange joint. <laughs> this little strange joint of what? So strange joint as in like the, the joints between their bones. Oh, okay, okay. So it's a, that would be like the unique identifier when you're like defining fossils or uh, doing, sorry, what's it called? Not taxidermy, dissections and other things. But yeah, bats are in the Laurasia theria group, and then rats and humans are in the UR liars group. So that's, that's where the division happens. We are in separate families. We've taken a different turn in our evolutionary history. Right. So bat is anything in the order Chiroptera. Uh, which comes from the ancient Greek uh, from Chire, which is hand, and Teron, which is wing. So they're, they're hand wings. That's their Latin term. Well, makes sense. Yeah, and that, that just kind of covers like everything that we call bats, and then you just get more specific from there. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, what makes bat evolution difficult to determine is that uh bats are really bad at fossilizing that's uh that's a that's a big if you had a report card for bats <laughs> fossilization huge ass. you guys aren't dying right come on so what makes it so difficult then is it because that they're just so small and their bones are so brittle that they just kind of dissolve yeah well they're they're small first of all uh to fly you got to have hollow bones or at least very very brittle bones um and things that fossilize or that are easy to find, there's things with the big bones that are, you know, they when they die, they they leave behind an impression. Whereas with bats, they probably got eaten or you know, I never th- or what have you. I never thought about that because, like, you look at like you know fossil records of like like the Jurassic era, say, and you see like you know there were, like tons of massive creatures and like things more giant than anything today, like dinosaurs or other like early early creatures, but how many things were much smaller than them that left no impact in the fossil record? We'll never see. Well, that's the thing. Like they, they estimate that only 12% of bats that have ever lived have been found Fascinating. in the fossil wow. record. That probably affects the environment a lot too, because, um, I don't know, depending on where they live, some things may not fo- fossilize as well. Like so many things we find are because of like types of soil or other things that are preserve bones more. And if you're a small creature with easily crushed or dissolved bones in an environment that is not conducive to preserving, like they often live in uh, like more human and tropical areas, then there's not much to, to, to keep that from just deteriorating. Yeah, exactly. And like, um, I don't know if you <laughs> were into dinosaurs as kids, but they always talk about like there are certain conditions that are very good for fossilization of like if it falls into a riverbed, that's like perfect. Uh, if it gets like covered in sand, you know, it's a, it's another good way of preserving the bones. All I know is that like tar is like the the mortal enemy of dinosaurs. Like land before time just makes it very clear. <laughs> yeah, well, obviously that was a very accurate documentary of the fossilization <laughs> process. 
Well, it is interesting how organics fossilize in general, right? Like, because if you, you know, uh, go basically go to the dump and, you know, you can dig and find something that has been functionally fossilized, but then if you crack it open, you can still see the organics inside because so they don't actually decompose, which is why composting is so important. Oh, man. Landfills. <laughs> And like composting has like special rules. Like you're actually not supposed to put too much meat in your composting. Some would say some places say no meat at all. You can't put dead animals in there just because it's like different bacteria and it mm -hmm. affects the whole uh, decomposition process. Yeah, there's a this spot out here that I go to take uh, garbage for, and they're like no dead animals. And I'm like I really don't want to think about the person who goes off here to just drop off like some roadkill. But there's also a bunch of cats that hang out in the area, so I wouldn't be surprised if they find their way in there by accident. But uh, mm -hmm. sorry, now we're talking about cat death on episode one. I'm so sorry, <laughs> people. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. They got eight more. <laughs> okay. So th uh, the oldest bat fossil they found is about 50 million years old. But they, they find these, um, these fossils in multiple locations around the world. So they can conclude that, okay, most likely these are not the first bats, but rather the first bats we've found. Uh, so they think that bats probably showed up around 65 million years ago, not too long after the dinosaurs died out. Really? Hmm. But even because they're, they're the way we found them is there's not much we found intermediate linking them either? Yeah, like there is, there is nothing, and then there is bats. <laughs> Just suddenly bats. <laughs> uh, and so basically when they do the math in terms of like the, uh, if you calculate the rate that DNA uh, mutates, uh, and sort of like the proliferation of the fossils, you can determine, okay, likely it was around 65 million years ago that the first common ancestor of bats lived. Um, and that's when they, they split off. And so there are some theories as to what was the quote-unquote proto-bat. That's fascinating. I've never heard of a uh, um, determining like age of species by like the rate of mutation. Is that a constant or is it variable by different species that we know today? Um, Oh, I don't know. I don't know the answer that's, to that. I that's assume probably way too deep. <laughs> yeah, I assume it's probably some sort of constant, or you can do like by the number of uh, chromosomes it has, it's going to mutate at this rate just because it has more DNA than another species. Or maybe you would compare uh, existing bat species and see, all right, how much does their DNA change from generation to generation, and compare it based no. on that. The, the number of species, you know, that you have to compare it to or the number of uh, specimens, I should say. So, like, you know, however many uh, types of the the bat that you find, you know, you, this is a different uh, evolution, et cetera, et cetera. Without a full dive, I'd assume that that's a good enough uh, thing where if you have the right enough values and data, you can formulaically determine that rate. That's cool. That's really cool. But so you say that the oldest one that they found is 50 million years, but then the, you know, they think it goes back to 65 million years. So what's in that 15 million year gap there? It's a mystery. They don't know. Ooh. But they've got some theories. The, I guess the, the big question for scientists is how did bats evolve? Because bats are very different to any other mammal alive today. Uh, for the most part, mammals do not echolocate. Uh, some do, but they they think it's a, a parallel, sorry, not parallel evolution. Um, what's it called? I thought pa not parallel evolution, evolutionary convergence? That's not the right one. Convergent evolution. That's the one, yes. Mm -hmm. We got there in the end. Yeah, we uh, so obviously, uh, dolphins are known to echolocate, and bats can echolocate. And while both dolphins and bats are in the Lo Laurasia theria group, uh, they are not... They didn't evolve from each other. So before you expect to see uh, fossils of dolphins with bat wings, um, <laughs> likely, likely these these skills uh, evolved convergently. Yeah, that sounds like something based on their environments that they would wind up using as communication, being it flying all the time or swimming all the time. Those are just more convenient for that kind of, like how those creatures function. But I mean, obviously, air and water, you know, transfer sound very differently. What are other, some other, uh, like, I guess, land-based creatures that also echolocate? Uh, in my research for this project, uh, there was a kind of shrew that can kind of echolocate. That's all I could find. Huh. <laughs> um, but yeah, echolocation is pretty rare in general. Um, so it's 
you would suspect that anything all all living bats while they do not echolocate they've got the the hardware to do so um so like a a a bat like a flying fox let me double check this i don't i think flying foxes do not <laughs> echolocate they're not hang on there are there are rather different species amongst them yeah they do not echolocate huh are they nocturnal like the other ones or are they kind of um Sort of. They they come out at dusk. Um, when I lived in Australia, you could, if you were in the right part of the town, uh, you could just see an entire colony of bats flying overhead for like an hour. Oh, oh so those, many of them. Flying foxes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Such amazing creatures. Um, but yeah, they they don't echolocate. But there are scientists think that um, just based on the the bones in their ears, that uh, most, if not all, bats at some point in their evolutionary history, could echolocate. And yeah, that's just kind of a leftover. Yeah, if we, if we go to the... Well, like if you're for the flying foxes, they don't need to echolocate because they eat fruit, and fruit doesn't... <laughs> it doesn't move around much. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's pretty easy to catch. So they think that the original proto-bat would have been a nocturnal creature that ate bugs. Because just comparing the, the way that bats are structured, they're kind of perfectly made for eating bugs. Um, so I think it was a nocturnal creature, eight bugs, um, and then the question is, did it first develop echolocation and then fly, or did it first fly and then develop echolocation? Mm-hmm. So they're, they're pretty confident on the answer. I'll take your, uh, your guesses at this point. All right, flying versus echolocation, which came f- Or did they both happen together? Yeah. I want to say the flying... Uh, yeah, I would say flying so. king first because it's like, well, like, again, I feel like the echolocation is a, is more because of their environment. If you're flying around in a full 3D space and you need to find food that's also moving in that 3D space, it works for that. Right. I guess it might depend on the diet of what bats had before they developed the ability to fly. But I would say flying came first. So you're both voting on flying first? Yep. Okay, well, let me, let me go through the, the options just to build some tension here. Okay, uh, drum roll. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll explain like the different, like, I guess scientists have worked out, here's what it would look like. I was not prepared for a pop quiz. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not prepared for anything. Well, well I, think, I think even scientists still aren't sure because like, they're, they're just not happy with, with the answer uh, as they've determined it. So, so for the theory of echolocation first, they think it would have been like a, a little mouse or a shrew-like creature that lived in trees that would that figured out that if it shrieked, it could find bugs more easily. Um, and then it would start shrieking more and more high-pitched to be able to figure out, okay, whenever I make the sound and I hear a sound back, there's a bug there, I can then catch it. Um, but the problem with this is that there are no creatures alive today that do this. So not to say that it couldn't be the case, but we just have no real life examples of this. And there's like nothing, nothing that lives in trees exclusively only eats bugs. Yeah. It's just such a weird way of doing anything compared to other species. So the problem with the flight first theory, Ooh, that's, that's, there's a tongue twister. (laughs) Um, is that uh, they know that the protobat most likely would have been nocturnal, um, just because all bats have um, very large eyes and adaptations for living at night. So the problem is, if you can fly at night, but you can't echolocate, you're going to just crash into things. Like it's not, it's not going to go very well for you. <laughs> the first bats are just having a real rough time. Uh, so they were thinking maybe it was both. Maybe just coincidentally, some mutant creature could both echolocate and kind of glide like a sugar glider um and then it figured it sort of evolved to the point where it could flap its arms and get powered flight and that's kind of how it worked um but there's a problem to the both theory uh those ancient bat fossils they found 50 million years ago yeah some of them can echolocate some of them cannot but both of them have wings really I wonder if that just is like the marker of like the difference. Like at some point, the ones that were better at catching food lived longer and probably had more mates, which is the basic part of evolution. And like they just managed to be the ones that survived and the ones that didn't know, like the locate did not. But doesn't that confirm flying first though? If it does. Have... Okay. Yeah, you think so. So <laughs> bats had a struggle <laughs> until they figured that out, or maybe 
maybe some of them had it and some didn't, like you said, like a mutation. Yeah, mm-hmm. so it's, well, I mean, none of the bats that couldn't echolocate <laughs> uh, provided descendants today, so that uh, didn't go very well for them. No. <laughs> um, now, have you guys ever read um, books by the author Kenneth Oppel? No, I can't know. say I have. Kenneth Oppel? Uh, okay, he's a Canadian author, um, but uh, like he's, he's written a couple of books, mostly for kids. Uh, one of the series he's written is about bats. Um, so the first book in the series is called Silverwing. Is this does this sound familiar? Hold on a second. Oh, hold on a second. Ah, uh, no, I almost think it do- it it does, but no, I I feel like I would have liked this as a kid, but no, I haven't seen it before. Uh, so basically, the premise of the book is that there are it's like from the perspective of bats. If bats had human level intelligence, so the bats have these legends. Um, whole mythology, uh, and it's about this one bat who gets separated from his uh, his colony on while they're doing their migration, and he has to make his way back home. So, like a Guardians of Gahu kind of thing. But that is my, literally my first thought. Thank yeah, you. only it's it's well, the first book is very grounded in reality because uh, the bats are always wondering what those mysterious humans are up to, and uh, well. Uh, this, so the main character, his name is Shade, and he has this friend named Marina. And Marina has been kicked out of her colony because she has a human ring on her, a human band. Um, and for the oh, bats, some bats think that this is a blessing. Some of them think it's a curse. But we, we as humans know that this is just a tracking band. Huh. Hang on a second. I know the guy who's <laughs> done like reviews of like this basic genre um on youtube uh he's done like gone through various of these like kind of animal stories where they like go over the like the same thing of like the different species of animals having their own society and basically being uh humanized enough to have speech but they're still very much functioning as animals uh and i can link you guys some of this in a bit uh cloud cuckoo country it's just his book reviews but he picks like the total trash and it's just a good time so that's the first book. That's uh, Silverwing. What would you say the, the age um, kind of target is for, for these books? Like middle school. Um, not that an adult wouldn't enjoy them. Like there are, there's adventure, there's intrigue. The characters are pretty good. Um, you know, I was, I was entertained reading the story. I've reread it again and, you know, it, it holds up. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the first one. So that's Silverwing. And then the series takes a turn. <laughs> so... Oh, well, actually, the second book is not too bad. Um, the only the only knock against that I would have is that randomly uh, the main character Shade kind of develops superpowers. So oh. the author gets a little uh, creative with what you can do with echolocation. Mm. They go like Daredevil. No, it's I've never heard any <laughs> anything like this before. So in the first one, he gets a little creative because um, he tries to explain how do bats instinctively know where. Uh, to go when they're migrating. And in his story, um, the bats' mothers sing them a map. And it's kind of like um, like a hologram type thing. Like it transfers a memory of a place. Like um, it's interpreting the bats' echolocation as, visual, as visualizing it through like the song of echolocation. Right. Huh. If that makes sense. It makes about as much sense as any other way people try to visualize echolocation. <laughs> Yeah, so anyway, uh, in book two, uh, which is called Sunwing, uh, Shade figures out that he can uh, echolocate solid objects of sound. Yeah, so that's a superpower. It's yeah. Just a, a sonic blast right there. Cool. So he just turns into Black Canary then. Yeah. Well, well, he'll do things like he'll echolocate a lock open because he can sing a key into <laughs> reality. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was thinking he would like shatter it or something, but no, he sings a key with just the right yeah. teeth to fit the hole. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's, that's impressive. Okay, I like that somebody thought of that at least. Good job, Kenneth Opal. That's yeah, that's like it's a, a creative idea. It's just a little, a little, huh? I don't think that's how that works. Um, <laughs> but then it goes on to describe something I find really interesting called Project X Ray. Have you heard of this? Project X no is this a real thing or something he made up the, the, this is real he, he made up the the narrative to go along with it uh because the bats are pretty traumatized by this as you will as you will soon find out why uh so project x-ray uh was a uh something that they worked on in um they uh, the allies worked on for world war ii 
the idea was that you would I mean it's it's the it's the forties. They're they're still trying to figure out uh technology that we take for granted. It's also um, known as the bat bomb. <laughs> yes. Uh so what they did is they took bats and they strapped bombs to them and they tried to teach them to to land in certain locations. Um and then they would ignite the explosives and blow up whatever their target was. And this was um, when the Allies accidentally genocided the whole moth colony. <laughs> What is this? Well, uh, it was all going great until uh, the bats uh, roosted under a fuel tank, and um, that was oh the end of their te- of their test range. Oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! Did nobody think that the animal was going to have a mind of its own and like to sit under things? And if you put them near a gas tank, they're usually raised above the ground. <laughs> they're going to want to rest under it. Well, uh, you know that's that's why they have military secrets, you know, just to uh, <laughs> just so that people don't find out their mistakes. Well, they've mulled over like attaching, you know, miniature bombs to mosquitoes and stuff before, so I guess this is just kind of uh, a good starting point. Uh, so yeah, the story is uh, he has to live through one of these experiments, um, and then it. Um, I guess I won't spoil too much. You know, it 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 has interesting twists and turns. Uh, then book three takes a complete twist because um, he has to go to the bat underworld, like the afterlife underworld, okay. to rescue the soul of his son. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So we've gone we've gone from like from like bat world with talking bats to like superpower bats to just like Dante's Inferno, but with bats. So I guess this then takes place in the forties because they have to live through. Project X-Ray? I guess it's not clear because uh, in the book, they escape. So they're going to be dropped off of a plane to bomb somewhere. Uh, They escape the plane and they land over uh, Rio de Janeiro, uh, which to my knowledge, the Allies would not have been bombing. So I don't, I'm not Hmm. sure what the deal is there. How long do they live? Uh, Probably only a couple years. Oh my god. Okay, so Kenneth, uh, suggestion for him. Uh, if he writes a book about dolphins that were in the experiments that they were doing trying to make dolphins talk, uh, <laughs> there's your next pitch. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, dear. Oh, so um, many we'll, we'll let people research that on their own. Yeah, um, go look at dolphins experiments. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh. But yeah, so that's the third book. And then the fourth book kind of deviates from the... Um, the established story because it uh, is set around the proto bats to tie us back into where I was going with this. Ah, we were going somewhere. You had a plan. Um, and so in that in that story, it's about kind of the first bats that uh, figure out that they can flap their their wings and oh, you're not supposed to do this because uh, that's that's just not the way it is. And it's, uh, I think the moral of the story is that uh, you got to get on board with change because spread your wings and fly. Otherwise, you go extinct. Yeah, spread your wings and fly. Yeah. Good. It's a progressive message from a book about, about. superpower. <laughs> that is, that's a wild looking series. I, I like the idea of trying to, you know, explain a lot through that. Yeah, like I, like I, as much as I critiqued it just now, uh, I did really enjoy it. Like it's, it's a good series. Um, had me interested. Uh, definitely recommend it. Um, but yeah, for for bats nowadays, they're pretty sure that you can divide them into two groups. Um, they've got some interesting names. You've got the Yinterochiroptera and the Yango Chiroptera. Did they deliberately try to do the yin and yang thing there? Sure they did. Probably. I don't know. I don't know the etymology of, of these terms. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, so they th- so they mostly are putting um, megabats in the yin yin tero chiroptera group with some microbats just based on their DNA. Um, so for whatever they've determined, they think that the megabats are just a little more different than the microbats, just when you oh. examine their features in DNA. Hmm. Um, but we have come a long way since. Uh, the flying primate hypothesis. Have you guys heard of this? Uh, no, I guess they just figured they were more similar to primates, but they flew? Or are we assuming that they were like monkeys with wings, like Wizard of Oz? 
Yeah, well, they there there was some evidence. So uh, if you look at the connection of a bat's eye to its brain and the connection of a human eye or a primate eye to a primate brain, it's very oh. similar um, in some bats. But you could also argue that you know, because lots of primates live in trees uh, and eat fruit, that a fruit bat would probably also need similar eye structure that probably evolved convergently. And they were also thinking that uh, maybe bats evolved from colugos. Do you know what a colugo is? Colugo. Uh, so a colugo is also known as a flying lemur, only unlike in the Avatar series, uh, it does exist. Are you telling uh, me there are real flying lemurs? <laughs> yes, they don't have giant ears, um, oh. and they don't fly. They, they glide. Uh, they're also not lemurs. They're, uh, they're just primates. Be my next question, okay. Um, but they were thinking that maybe colugos evolved into bats. And if you look at a picture of a colugo, they look an awful lot like a bat, uh, although they are not bats. I can see some similarities, especially in like the facial structure um, and ears. And of course, they have like webbed uh, limbs to kind of help glide, I guess. And the claw shape, too. Interesting. Oh, that's but so it's weird. All, all conversion evolution. So it might have been a creature very similar to a colugo that had the same niche as a colugo and since has gone extinct and the only ancestors sorry the only descendants from this hypothetical creature are the bats uh and then the colugos have since taken over that niche in their uh ecosystems but uh yeah they're just really they really don't know where bats came from they just appeared that's fascinating it's like something we just don't, ha we've been tracing in the fossil record, but there's just a cutoff point where it's just, oh, they, we don't have any more bats. <laughs> and yeah, bats uh, face an uncertain future. Um, I think certainly uh, what is relevant to modern times, uh, specifically right now, is the bats' relationship to the coronavirus. <laughs> oh, man. Very unfortunate uh, time to be a bat. That was something I was going to ask you about. Like, I don't know if your research kind of got this far, but in terms of like zoonotic transfer, you know, they think it may be something jumped from a bat to a pig and then to a human. So like, what is kind of the evolutionary relationship when it comes to um, how these diseases can transfer? So what they think happens in bats um, is that because flight uses so much energy, the bats are just running very, very hot. Um, so anything, any weak viruses or bacteria that would infect a bat just cannot survive. Like mm -hmm. when you get a fever, that's your body trying to um, just boil anything to death inside of you. Um, bats are constantly boiling. So if you are a, uh, an aspiring virus, perhaps looking to infect a bat, you have to be very good at resisting heat um, mm -hmm. and just like a very sturdy, resistant virus. Um, and so when... Uh, viruses do transfer from bats i think they were they're thinking this time it came from from a bat to a pangolin or from a pangolin to a bat some pangolins were evolved were involved in some way um that just sort of the only thing that came out of the uh the soup <laughs> the boiling soup of the the bats immune oh. system was this novel coronavirus that was the only thing that could survive because bats are probably constantly bombarded with these diseases that just don't just don't make it. Yeah, I've, I've heard some other things like bats, but being largely isolated from other mammals, like they tend to catch viruses or other diseases that the, the rest of the like mammal genome is not the right word, but um, like other mammals just aren't commonly exposed to. But I don't think that's the case in terms of the coronavirus because one, they're well. It's not the same thing, but there have been other coronaviruses that have affected mammals. And two, if we have traced it back to bats, then we know that that's not how that happened. Um, yeah, so hopefully bats, hopefully we uh, can learn to take a little better care of our environment um, just for the, the sake of the bats. And then they're, they're also, it's not looking good for the bats, uh, especially in North America, or at least for hibernating bats. Um, have you heard of white nose disease? White? Yes. Uh, I feel like I have. So uh, white, white nose disease is a fungus that when bats are hibernating, it grows over the bats' faces, over their noses, um, and just suffocates them to death in their sleep. Oh, that is, that is so unfortunate. Yeah. And they, they think it's from uh, people spelunking in caves. They just unintentionally bring in the spores, um, and it just 
loves to grow on bats and um they there's there's no there's nothing the bats can do about it Ugh. i wonder if that's because obviously they're breathing and like I guess at some point the air around the nose would be more moist than other parts of the cave or warm. And it would be a good environment for fungus to grow. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Yikes. I feel like moist, dank things. I, uh, I, in a previous home, I had a problem with mold. I, I probably told you guys about this in the past. Um, but there was a, uh, an issue with the neighbor I shared a wall with and something that they broke with a water heater uh, caused a lot of mold growth in my home. And oh my gosh, mold is nasty. Like it is a pain to get rid of. And I got rid of it. It's gone. But um, oh, that is not a fun thing to deal with. And imagine just that growing on you. Just oh, that, that Jimmy's rustled. Very rustled. Hmm. <laughs> Were you able to get rid of like the, the staining? Because that's always an interesting thing with mold too. Is like it, it'll leave color behind. Oh, I just straight up tore that, that uh, gypsum board out. I was like, no, we're, we're gone. Just, burn it hey i was gone forever i was kind of looking because there's like a um wikipedia at least on the white nose syndrome page has a list of bats um in north america that are affected by it um it seems most of them are in least concern but that doesn't that doesn't mean it's not threatening them but then there are also some uh like the gray bat and little brown bat and the northern myotis um are like threatened or endangered um actually quite a few are and they all succumb to this too, so their already dwindling population is affected by just like a fungus that grows in their face while they're hibernating. It's, yikes! I didn't realize white nose fungus was uh, kind of contained to North America, and I guess a little bit of Central America too. It looks like, but uh, what prevents that from being, you know, like in different parts of the world? Um. Well, it might just be like the time it takes to hike. Like if you are a hiker who goes everywhere, I don't know. Maybe there's just better hiking in North America compared to Europe. Um, I don't. I don't actually know. Or maybe like the time it t- like if you were hiking in a North American cave, if you then got on a plane get to Europe, any spores that are on you have since fallen off. Yeah, okay. Or if this is a spore that yeah, if this is a spore that's native to the Americas and is just not present in other areas, how, how, what could it survive on long enough to get from a, a human carrying it abroad to another bat? Uh, I don't know. It could happen. Clearly, we've <laughs> we've seen pathogens make it across seas rather quickly if given the right uh, circumstances. <laughs> but this is. Yeah, fungus and the way it grows is all kinds of weird. Personally, like I would rather have bats than well, I mean bats. Uh, most of the bats that are being threatened are bats that eat insects. So uh, we're talking mosquitoes. We're talking things that I don't want to be alive. And if I had yeah. to choose between bats being alive and mosquitoes being alive, I'm gonna pick the bats. Yeah, I'll take bats too. <laughs> they're they're bad out of everything out around there. I ugh, mosquitoes are bad, and if people think like you know swarms of bugs are bad now, without their common threat pet predators like bats or bug or, or other bugs like spiders or uh, frogs, um, bug swarms would be a whole lot worse. They'd be massive. And you know, I'm pretty sure more people die from malaria than they do rabies. So also true. Yeah, well, in general, people, I mean, people, it's a very common phobia to be afraid of bats. Um, but bats, um, well, there's this, I was going to talk about this, but I thought, oh, everyone probably knows this by now. It's like one of those things that, did you know? But everyone knows. Uh, bats are not blind, uh, even though they echolocate. They do have very good night vision in addition to that. Uh, they're not going to fly at you on purpose. Uh, they're just looking for bugs. That's all, that's all they want. <laughs> it's all they want in life. You're not gonna, yeah. It, I don't think it's common for them to go after people unless there's, you know, you're in their space, and their space is rather broad, so they probably still avoid you. But well, caves are a lot narrower in general, so you know, easier to come across them. True, unless you unless you live in the office and someone lets a bat in, and you get <laughs> well, that's that's a different story. <laughs> that's a way to catch rabies. I guess I could look up like what is uh, it's, I think that's a difficult question for Google to answer. What is the how many people have gotten rabies from bats? I have to imagine it's a very low number. There is a general like bats are one of those creatures that I think people kind of wind up vilifying in one way or another. Um, and probably not like out of any real problem, although there are things like rabies that they can cause or other issues. But it's just there's a lot of associations 
I don't know, between bats and other uh, things like heck, look at like vampire mythology over the years. Yeah, like, and, uh, the evolution of the vampire mythology. So how did that, how, where, where did that, who was the first vampire? I mean, Dracula, obviously, but. Dracula, is, yeah, would be the one everyone thinks of. And even then the way people interpret that is, always different but bats i believe have been in there since bram stoker wrote dracula um, bram stoker just uh he just hated bats <laughs> so, nah, <laughs> i'm gonna ruin these guys entire entire lives nah. but, but yeah it also depends on like what culture so uh i'm reading here that uh in tonga in um the south pacific uh the bat is considered sacred really? uh, and it's thought to be the physical manifestation of the soul oh Physical of like a person's soul, yeah, like every every person's soul. So when you see a bat at night, they thought the Tonga Tongalese Tong, Tongan people thought that um, that was someone's soul huh. escaping their body or living in the afterlife. That's a that's an interesting that's an interesting concept, and I guess I don't know what they might have seen, but could you see like a swarm of of flying creatures? And think of that as like, you know, like souls of other, like the little dead passing on. I don't know. That's interesting. Uh, in China, it's uh, a symbol of good luck. Not anymore. Well, <laughs> hey. <laughs> oh. It's part um, of that calendar, too, isn't it? There's a year. Am I making that up? No. You're the bat. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Uh, but like, yeah, like um, the uh, Mesoamerica, some of them um, had bat deities. Uh, I mean, you look at Batman from the comics. Um, there are certainly positive depictions of bats. In the heavy metal community, you bite the heads off of bats. Oh yeah, exactly. Like oh yeah, that's how you land a job. So I mean, bats they they have uh, good reputations, bad reputations. Depends where you go. Yeah, I wonder. I just wonder how much that might affect like people interested in pr in protecting the endangered ones. And there are absolutely uh, preservations. I've seen a few for uh, uh, like fruit bats and other such things. Well, I think one of the, the problems they've got is that some of them are just so ugly. <laughs> They're not super appealing. Like you can like, you know, do a shelter for like pets or other creatures. And it's like, oh, you don't want to save these uh, majestic creatures? And it's like, when it's got like a snub nosed vampire bat, it's like, no. I think you need a different pitch with that. You need to be like, okay, do you want to be devoured by mosquitoes? No? Yeah, okay. exactly. <laughs> Save bats. <laughs> um, so yeah, my, my big hope is that bats don't go extinct because, I mean, future archaeologists are sure going to be confused why uh, suddenly bats appear in the fossil record and then just just to suddenly disappear. Um, bats are cool, you know? I, I hope we've learned a couple things about bats, um, and I hope they, uh, they go on to, uh, to live long, long, successful lives. Doing their batty things. I mean, as a species, not as individuals, because... Well, no. I respect whatever they do as individuals, but, the, you know, the species, you know, they're pretty cool, too. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's all I got on bats. That's cool. I've... That, that's more than I've known about them with evolution and other such things. I've learned some things about bats. Good. That, that was my goal. Mission accomplished. Um, so yeah, this was David. And Aiden. And JJ. Hey, thanks for listening to our first episode. We will be posting this on all major podcast and social media outlets, so feel free to follow us if you'd like regular updates on the show. Be sure to leave us a review on whichever podcast service you use so that other people can hear about the show too. We'd love to hear your feedback on the show, as well as suggestions for future episode topics. And if you want to show your support for what we're doing, we also have a Patreon, which just allows us to post more frequent episodes and invest in making the podcast a higher quality. Um, thank you for your support, and hope to see you next time. <laughs>